welcome. <laughs> welcome to all of you who have joined tonight, the uh, joining the IAWE, the Israel Association of Writers in English. It's a really great pleasure to, to welcome you all, and especially to welcome and uh, Jonathan, especially Jonathan Wilson, whose ninth, ninth book is getting these amazing reviews that um, are not enough. Not They can't give you enough praise for this book. This is a book that uh, uh, I keep stopping to check the facts. <laughs> I never do that. Uh, and they're always right. Or almost always. Uh, most of you, many of you know previous novels by Jonathan. You know, you probably know the the uh, two novels that were uh, about Mandate Palestine, the Hiding Room, and 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 the uh, Palestine Affair that won prizes in it in their time, but nothing like what this what you're going to win now. Uh, Perhaps you know, perhaps some of you know the short story collections, the two story story collections, Shum and 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 Ambulance is on the way, and the soccer book kick, kick and run. You you may know all of these, but you have probably not had a chance to read the Red Balcony since it's only been out for two days. You have to be really fast. Uh, you could you could get the audible and turn it on speed. You could no, but better to read it slowly and read it well, uh, because every fact here is important. Every and every fiction is important. Uh, it's a real page turner. You're really going to like it, and. There's another reason I really like it, and that's because uh, because Jonathan is a scholar and has written books on uh, on Shagat, on um, you know Bello. I mean, you know, he knows how to do his research. So you're going to really enjoy this book when you read it, uh, and I hope you'll also enjoy. Uh, Jonathan, I know that you're all on mute and we're all ready. Hi, Karen. Sorry. Hi, Hello, Brian. everybody. Hello, Jonathan. Hi. Welcome to our Zoom. I do apologize. Um, traffic was awful. Thank you very much. And I have just introduced Jonathan and it just will start all over because so many people have come in since then. Jonathan, Jonathan Wilson might be remembered or has been remembered by many friends of mine who say, oh, the guy, that beautiful man who taught at Hebrew University um, and then at Tel Aviv University, I was in love with him. So you are remembered, it's not, if, if not as a famous author, as a very, very good lecturer. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, um, and you have lived through all right, moving right along. Okay. Moving right along. Um, okay, we're going to start again with, with the Red Balcony, which is the ninth book of, of that Jonathan has published and will now be the biggest, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because it is has so much history. Jonathan, take, please take over, because I'm babbling. Uh, with... What do you want me to talk about? Ask, ask I me. would like you to talk about what is the Red Balcony about. Okay. And we can then discuss it if you like. Okay. The questions I, come at the end. Yeah. And I hope there'll be some questions from you because I believe you have relatives who were in the car that drove our Lazar off to the hospital, unless I'm mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, the real story. The Red Balcony is uh, set uh, in the aftermath of the murder of Al Lazarov for the most part of the novel, although it begins with uh, a scene that was um, very uh, 
um, uh, inspirational for me, which was a photograph I saw of the swastika flag flying from the Hotel Fast uh, in 1933. The Hotel Fast, which I knew when I lived in Jerusalem as the Barclays Bank on the corner of Ben Yehuda Street in 1933, it was the Hotel Fast and uh, catered to a lot of um, German tourists visiting the Holy Land. And after Hitler came to power, um, the, he switched the flag. There were two alternate Nazi uh, German flags for a bit. One was the Nazi swastika. And the Hotel Fast ran it up next to the Union Jack. And I remember seeing this image and uh, being uh, astonished by it and found it quite chilling to see a swastika flying over Jerusalem. And I, uh, I'd written two previous novels set during the British Mandate, one of which, and uh, both of which in a way sent, uh, took, were, took as their springboard uh, pol actual historical political assassinations, one from uh, Lord Moyne, uh, in I think 1941, and and uh, Jacob de Haan in 1924, which is a, a Palestine affair, um, and uh, the inspiration for I think the trigger for all the novels in a way was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, and the conversation that took place afterwards, the sort of uh, shock and the long discussion about how unprecedented this was and how Jews simply did not politically assassinate other Jews when, of course, history tells us a different story. And I wanted to look into the uh, aftermath of the uh, Lazarov murder. Um, and uh, it's a story about, a, and I merge, historical figures and fictional characters. Uh, and it's a story about a young man, a young British Jewish man, Ivor Castle, who's just graduated in jurisprudence from Balliol College, Oxford, and who comes out to mandate Palestine to assist uh, the lawyer, the chief barrister for the defense in the al case, who in my novel is a fictional character named Phineas Barron. And, um, he gets involved with a potential witness, uh, uh, Siona Kerem, who may or may not be a key figure in the defense as a witness, may or may not be able to provide an alibi. And there are various uh, ramifications. I won't give away the whole plot. Of course, there's no um, uh, there's no need uh, to tell you what Arlotarov's fate was. Um, and uh, uh, and there are a lot of twists and turns in the in the plot. And um, one of the things that I had to assist me while I was writing was I came across I was able to get on uh, Abe Books a transcript of the major speeches at the trial that was published just a couple of months. I think I have it here somewhere. Uh, just a couple of months after. Oh, here, here it is. Here it is. I'll show you the page. I'm going to pick out with this. Um, it was published in Jerusalem just a couple of months um, after the trial had ended in 1934. And it's an extraordinary, um, extraordinary book, extraordinary documents, um, uh, because the trial itself when you read the documents, turns out to be conducted by these extraordinarily sophisticated Rumpole of the Bailey type British barristers. The British barristers, by the way, were allowed to wear wigs in 1934 uh, the, and, the, and the British judges. The Jewish and Arab judges weren't allowed to wear wigs. They were just there to cancel each other out in the, in the decision making. Um, and the trial itself is... is uh, uh, just quite an extraordinary experience. And I was blown away by the incredible detail and the incredible sophistication of the, of the speeches and the documents. And uh, uh, it's a, as you know, it's a sort of um, a, a case that remains unsolved to this day. Um, and it's a case that 
uh, I think cements, uh, rather than puts in place, but cements the schism between the right and the left that we witness the ramifications of to this present day. It, it widened the split, it broadened the chasm, um, something that has never uh, been filled, never come together again. So in that way, uh, it represents a, a fascinating starting point for a view in uh, for a view of the history that 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 leaches into that leaches into the present. Um, so that's uh, I don't want to give away too much of what happens in the plot, but that's pretty much what the what the novel is about. I remember when I was writing the novel at, at one point. Uh, when Netanyahu who had been accused of corruption, one of his aides said, "Next, they're going to accuse him of murdering our Lazarov." So I thought, "Oh, you know, this 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 place this still lingers in the imagination." My favorite moment, though, writing the novel was I was in Israel a few years ago, right at the beginning of the novel, and I got involved, which was a mistake, in a political conversation with a taxi driver. And at one point, I asked him who he thought murdered Al Lazarov, and he said, "It's not a man; it's a street." And I thought, "Yeah." <laughs> and I thought, "Yeah." Um, it was a one just wonderful response. And but of course, the street starts at the site of Al Lazarov's murder, which was where, um, which was where the beach in front of the Hilton Hotel now is. Um, so it's no, it's no accident that the street starts there. And that's where the novel begins too. Well, the novel begins with the running up of the swastika flag um, and then moves. Uh, there's a chapter featuring our Lozarov. And for the most part, with very few exceptions, um, I try not to put into the historical figures' mouths anything that they didn't actually say or believe in. With the fictional characters, of course, I have endless freedom. So that that's that's the story of the the red balcony of the title. Uh, Siona Karen, the sort of femme fatale of the novel, lives in um, lives in an apartment on Betzalel Street in Jerusalem. Uh, not that I have to admit is not too different to one that I lived in myself, which was in the the house that Boris Schatz built in the grounds of the old Betzalel Art School. I lived in that house, and my landlord was his son, Lilik Schatz. Um, and the bal and the balcony is, of course, I I couldn't call the novel in English the Red Mere Peset, but I would have liked to, um, because that's her balcony, and uh, it's where some of the serious action takes place. So. That's the beginning. For people who don't know, um, on the beach, on the promenade in Tel Aviv, at the point of the shooting, there is a andata, uh, um, how do you say that, a monument to the fact that on this spot, Alozarov was shot. He wasn't killed, he was shot. Right. Um, and further down the promenade is another one that says here was the Altalina. So you have <laughs> these two things uh, yeah. on the promenade. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Amazing, it is amazing uh, description of what the book is about. But now, perhaps you want to tell us, you want to give us an example, because the whole book doesn't sound like an intellectual conversation about history. It sounds no. very much alive. Uh, uh, perhaps you, you have a passage you would like to read. Sure. Uh, uh, um, okay. Um, I can read, I'll read you um, just, uh, I'll read you the, the, the very first, the, the sort of prologue to the book, if you like, is, is the scene in Jerusalem where these two young, Arab boys who work at the hotel fast are instructed by Herr Curler, who runs the place to run up the swastika flag over Jerusalem. Then the, there's a small section that features our Lazarov and culminates in, in the murder. And then we move to Tel Aviv in August. And I'll, I can read you a little of 
of Ivor Castle's uh, of that chapter. It was Tel Aviv in August 1933. Ivor Castle emerged from the Esther cinema into the yellow slant of early evening sunlight and the unremitting late summer heat he had tried to escape inside. He had been in Palestine for three weeks, settling in, taking steps to arrange the official residency that would allow him to take part in the Alozarov murder trial. It was Ivor's father who had secured him the position of assistant to Mr. Phineas Barron, the distinguished King's counsel who was leading the defense of the two Russian Jews accused of the crime. Edwin Castle, who had prudently changed the family name from Schloss two years before the outbreak of the Great War, was himself an eminent barrister, and Ivor had followed in his father's footsteps, graduating from Balliol College, Oxford, with his BA in jurisprudence a year ago. So here he was in steamy Tel Aviv, and this was his first working day that he had allowed himself some free time. For two weeks, the Esther had advertised only Austrian language films, a trick, or so he'd been told, to get around the local Jewish boycott of German films, or any that featured a known Nazi actor. There were simply too many eager German-speaking paying customers in the city. Now, Mercifully, management had succumbed to the box office bonanza promised by King Kong. Beauty had killed the beast, but who wouldn't want to hold Fay Ray in the palm of his hand? Beauty was responsible for all kinds of problems, including Ivor's own. At Oxford, he hadn't been able to resist with Annabelle Benton, and she had married someone else. And the same with Andrea Lowenstein and Clara Halstead, each of them stunning in their own way, and each committed inexorably, it seemed, to both reeling him in and casting him out. His evening was open. He wasn't due in Jerusalem until the following afternoon. Once there, he would conduct a preliminary examination of a potential witness, Siona Karen, a woman whom the police had somehow overlooked or rather noted and dismissed. She had, according to police notes, sat for a lengthy period in the Jerusalem cafe, where a waiter believed he might have spotted Stavsky and Rosenblatt, the two men accused of Arlozarov's murder, in the hours before they set out for Tel Aviv on the night of the killing. And if it was Baron's clients in the Hasharon, and if the hour was late, then how could the accused have managed the 90-minute drive to Tel Aviv in time to murder Arlozarov on the beach? So Baron delegates the task of interviewing Siona to Iva, and uh, Iva uh, is out on a walk. Iva walked now in the direction of the sea and the cooling breeze that he craved, but it was a forlorn hope. Experience had already taught him that it was better to succumb, to accept the sweat that dribbled down his back and the permanent presence in his pocket of handkerchief to wipe his brow, the clammy sensation of his shirt and shorts stuck to his skin. You have dark hair and an olive skin complexion. You won't burn, his mother had told him shortly before he boarded ship in Southampton. But the hottest place she had ever visited was Provence, and she had taken that holiday in with his father in balmy May. Ivor felt his eyebrows singe almost as soon as they docked in Haifa. The tip of his nose was still red, painful to the touch, likewise the back of his neck. In a few minutes, the brown hues of the setting sun would envelop the city, but there would be no relief. The night would bring its own version of life in a cauldron. Ivor arrived at the cafe as the lights came up. He's going to the casino cafe, uh, which no longer exists, of course. Um, Ivor arrived at the cafe as the lights came up on all three stories. I, I'm skipping some paragraphs. The place was beginning to fill up, men in long trousers and sports jackets, women in dresses. It seemed to be one of the few recreational spots in the city where formality was regarded as a virtue. At his own hotel, the Bella Vista, an orchestra played six nights a week on the patio or in the garden, but neither those who listened nor those who danced followed a dress code. Ivor liked that immediately about Tel Aviv. He had hated wearing his gown at Oxford. Or perhaps he had just hated being a Jew there, something that the leveling conformity of the black robe had distinctly failed to hide. So do you want me to, is that enough? Or? Oops, it's lovely. Uh, um, you want a little more? Uh, or is that no, I know I'm, there are questions already, but yeah. I would like to. Yeah. Like to begin with the question of um, 
the, the British involvement in, yeah. the, in the whole mess that we're in today, that you really, you, you uh, hint at all over the place and don't, and because it's a novel, you don't say. Uh, but can you say something more about that? Well, uh, I, do, I do think that, um, you know, there's a tendency not to look, I, I don't know, it's per, maybe there's not a tendency in Israel, but I, I think it, uh, that it's beneficial to look a little further back uh, to the roots of the conflict and to talk perhaps a little more about British and French colonialism in the Middle East and the way the place was carved up by the British and the French and what the French did in Lebanon and what the British did in Palestine and what the British and the French did in Egypt and how, uh, you know, there was a, there was a, a complex uh, colonial game being played there. And, uh, uh, and, uh, one of the things that I guess fascinated me is that uh, by even by the early 1930s, nothing was nothing was uh, fixed in stone, and uh, there were still various um, sort of um, s streams of conflicting and different notions of what Zionism was and what its potentials were in in many different areas, and that and that it but it, it was often guided and instructed and hemmed in and by the British who had, who, who we have to say were not in exactly the easiest situation in the world. And one of the reasons why uh, this particular moment is so pivotal, I, I guess one of the things I should have said about the novel is, of course, the issue surrounding um, Alozarov's murder had to do with the, the transfer agreement, which nobody likes to talk about too much for obvious reasons. And um, uh, there was this sort of pendulum that would swing, you know, the pressure to allow Jewish immigrants to come from Germany, which in turn would then trigger a response in the local Arab population who didn't want a large influx of uh, Jewish immigrants and the British sort of playing one side off against the other, more or less all the time. Um, and... Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, that, I mean, as you say, I'm not writing a history, um, I'm, but I am trying to, um, I am trying to represent the, that world and, and the, and the, um, the, the British impact on, on, on the society and on, on what happened next. And, and the German impact, because but my husband pointed out when we were reading the book that uh, he always wondered why all the German immigrants at the time came with um, tiles with balatot. He said they they all came with these with these very strange things. Well, that was part of the exchange, right? Yeah. That was yeah. part of the, they were allowed they to bring the German world. goods. Yeah, yeah. Goods. They were only allowed to bring to use their money to purchase German. Could you could you elaborate a little bit on that, Jonathan? Because it, it's a it's a um, a lead motif that runs through this whole saga, um, the relations between the Zionist um, organization and 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 Germany Nazis and and this transfer. Could you elaborate a little bit? I'm sure most people don't know about it. Well, yeah, um, sure. Um, I think that uh, the, maybe the first thing to say is that from the larger world's point of view, when Hitler came to power, um, it wasn't manifest immediately to them what the future was going to be or how bad things already started to be were for Jews. For example, the New York Times, I think had a front page article written by one of its journalists saying, you know, essentially, well, Hitler's just a cuddly guy, you know, he's just a sweetie and it'll be okay. And so they're bonking a few Jews on the head, but you know, that'll, that'll pass. And, um, but uh, for Jews, of course, thing, things had started to go down south almost immediately and even earlier. Um, and uh, there, there was, um, uh, so Ben-Gurion 
essentially sent uh, Lazarov to negotiate. And what happened was the Germans, there was a boycott of, of, of uh, a Jewish boycott of, of, of German goods, of German enterprise. And uh, uh, Ben-Gurion packed our Lazarov off to negotiate uh, a deal with, with, uh, with Hitler's Germany. And they were trying to get Jews out. Um, and the deal was that Jews were not allowed to bring their money out, but they were allowed to purchase German goods and import them to the Yeshuv, and which helped the economy of the Yeshuv and helped get Jews out of, of Germany. From the German point of view, the Germans were able to turn around and say, hey, the Palestinian Jews aren't boycotting us. Why are you? About the American Jews, you know, wh why are you doing that? So it was good for them. It was also good. This is the, you know, the bad news that nobody really wants. It also helped their economy, because the 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 Jewish money was used to boost the the German economy by the purchase of German goods. From the point of view of the the, so it was an unsavory deal, but one that did succeed in getting sixty thousand. 50 to 60,000 Jews out of Germany and into Palestine. Um, but from the point of view of uh, the Jabotinskyan revisionists, any deal with the Nazis was a deal with the devil. And I think one can understand that point of view as well. Um, but there was um, enormous um, furor in the Yeshuv uh, and animosity in the newspapers and other play, places directed against uh, our Lazarov. Not unlike um, that famous rally in uh, Zion Square where Netanyahu, you know, where there were the signs comparing Rabin to a Nazi. Um, and the end result was the same. Um, so that agreement. Uh, uh, is a, a very significant element of the, the plot in the novel, uh, in one way, uh, and and that 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 that's pretty much what is that is that what you meant? Yeah, that, well, that that explains it because, but how did it sort of reflect later, and uh, not on the murder of Rabin, but on the um, attack on the Knesset by Begin? For reparations, I mean that seems to be a, a, a comparable um, situation. Or stuff. yeah, well, it's interesting about Begin because um, you know the 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 Labour Zionist Party line from the moment of uh, uh, Lazarov's murder or assassination was that this had been the the work of right wing revisionist Russian Jews. And they and Begin uh, resented that. And in the 1980s, he organized a commission to look into the murder of Alozarov. And the result of the commission was no finding. You know, it wasn't resolved one way or another. It hasn't been. It's a cold case. It hasn't been resolved to this day. I mean, what what muddies the water is the fact that um, during the trial, a young Arab man confessed to the murder. And then two days later, he retracted the confession and claimed that he'd been bribed while in jail, uh, on another, accused of another murder. He'd been bribed to confess to the murder, which was something that the court went with. They didn't know that was never explored as a sort of radical and um, persuasive alternative to the idea that uh, Stavsky and Rosenblatt, and there was somebody else as well, had, had committed the crime. And one of them was, was found guilty, and the, 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 the sentence overturned on appeal on what, and, and in the novel, I, I, I use the transcript of the trial, and I don't make anything up about it. Uh, and so when, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, Somebody at some point said that had it been tried in a British court, the conviction would have stood. But because it was a sort of partly Ottoman law, it was able. There was a, there was a, a, a 
something that could it was able to overturn it but but you know but i i also want to say that yeah so so that's it i also want to say that the bulk of the novel involves and this goes back to the issue of sort of british jewish stuff involves a sort of crisis of identity for this young man ivor castle who doesn't come out to palestine as a zionist he really has no political interest at all he has a best friend from Oxford who's also out in Palestine, Charles Gross, who is a diehard Jabotinskian. Uh, but Ivor himself is a naive and a romantic, and he's sort of there for an adventure. And he's not politically affiliated, and uh, and he gets caught up in everything. Um, but I don't want to say too much about that. Not too much. But you're talking all about history. and, and Yes. On all, we can go, go on all evening because this is so so relevant to the history today and to the situation today. But let me ask you about literature. That yes, is, oh, good. You, yeah. you have this love story that is very integral to the plot. It's very yeah. integral to history. And do you see the connection or did you plan a connection between, you know, uh, between love and and history uh, between the yeah. foregrounding of the of the love story and the backgrounding of the uh, yeah well you know the the epigraph to the novel um, is a quote that that from Pierre Vidal Naquet that says to understand historical reality it is sometimes necessary not to know the outcome and. I think one of the great dangers when you're writing historical fiction is that you know too much and you want to make sure that your characters don't know too much, um, that the, the unprecedented, unprecedented things are about to occur historically, but nobody knows, nobody's aware of it. And you don't want to have that situation where the characters are too well aware or somehow embedded in them is the future. Um, so I like the idea of uh, somebody, of creating a character who moves through this charged historical world without any particular affiliation, without any particular history. And in fact, he's caught, he's, he's confused because in England, although he's done very well, um, there's a sort of seam of anti-Semitism that he's responding to. And in Palestine, he doesn't feel at home among the Jews of the Yeshuv. He feels more English when he's there. Um, so to have him get involved uh, um, with this um, compelling and attractive artist, Siona Kerem, also allowed me, the, the love story allowed me to explore those areas of society in the Yeshuv that maybe get pushed to the side because of all the big history that's going on, which is that there was a bohemian artistic world in both Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in those years. And this is a world that I was able to, to enter. Um, and that uh, certainly his, his passionate involvement with uh, Siona is... Uh, uh, that turns his life inside out, um, uh, I think enables me to, to, I mean, there's a sense in which I want, I want to have a character, and I think it would e even exist now to, to, to say like, what is, what would it be like to have a life where you were free of political discussion? You know, in the Middle East. I mean, everybody does, right, to a degree. You know, it's not like, you know, regular life doesn't go on. Uh, while all the big stuff is going on. And, I, and I, I'm always interested in the characters who get tossed one way or another by big history, whose, whose small lives are impacted in ways that they're hardly even aware of. And I, so I throw him into, the, into this situation. I don't, I don't know if that answers that. Right, I, want to ask, I want to ask this, that this is the, an event of the association of... Uh, um, Association. Israeli Association of Writers in English. Yes. And what you describe now as the alienation of being here, I, I think probably most people on this uh, event 
feel have felt that or feel it at some time we're, we're all lim and and like we leave the comforts of our home culture and we come to this um different place and we want it to be home we are zionists most of us and and we want this to be home but there there is a pull and push and and uh at least for me uh sometimes i've been here many many years a discomfort or, or alienation and so i'm a, i want to know whether the character you just described and the feelings that you um, put into his mouth. Did you feel this way when you lived here? Was this how you felt that, you know, well, I'm English, but I, I you must have faced anti-Semitism in England. Uh, I did. Um, and yeah. then you come here and you're, you know, you're on a red balcony. I mean, like, you know, what was it like for you? Is, is that how you created the character? Well, the red balcony was a lot of fun. I can tell you that right now, um, but yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I, I mean, I hope that I wasn't as uh, naive as as I, my character is. I mean, I, he's not a representation of me as a necessary as a young as a young man. But of course, you know the the um, uh, the the pushes and tugs and pulls and paradoxes of of being English, where, where you know, I, one thing I did give to Ivor in that sense was, yeah, this sense that, like, after all, uh, you know, nothing. I, I I did experience considerable anti-Semitism in England, but on the other hand, there nothing prevented me from going to Oxford in England. Nothing prevented people from becoming judges in England, nothing prevented them from reaching the highest levels of society. And and for example, one of the things I, I guess I wanted to do in terms of my, I mean, my father, for example, who worked for, who was observant and who worked for the United Synagogues of Great Britain all his life, thought England was the, that's the most wonderful place. And uh, despite the fact that he was very aware of, of uh, you know, lived through Mosley and through anti-Semitism, but he's, um, and, uh, I guess one of the things is, I, I, and as you say, I'm not, I'm not alone in this. This sort of shifting feeling that when I was in England, I felt very Jewish. That that was the most foregrounded thing about my personality within the society, and that it often arose in a very grotesque form. Um, when I moved to uh, Israel, um, I often felt quite English. You know, also there was no Premier League on TV in England in those in Israel in those years, which was like a nightmare. You know, the, the first division, Kadurego, and you know, uh, and uh, I also experienced I, before I moved to Israel. I was living in New York for a while, and I remember feeling like I, I extraordinary. Like I never really seen Jewish people having fun before in my life, you know, in, in a certain very, very deep way that came from living in, in a majority. Um, and one of the things I experienced both in Israel and in, in America is that, and in New York certainly, was like, so you're Jewish, so what? You know, big deal. In England, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. So, so the so what aspect means that other aspects of your personality can come to the fore. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's not only, you know, people have come from English speaking countries it come from anywhere, you're going to feel you're going to feel those things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, sure, my, my, of course, my experience informs that consciousness to us to, to one degree or another. But that is, uh... I had, a, I had a lot of laughs. That still doesn't it. It tells it doesn't tell us why you go back to the mandate, which is oh, right. uh, and and, be, and when you told me you were going to writing about it, and I said to you, my father-in-law, my father-in-law drove uh, yeah. Alazarov to the hospital. Yeah, tell us about uh, that. When when Begin was uh, making the uh, you know making, he, he decided to have another trial, and he called my father-in-law who had. 50 years before taken uh, Arlozarov to the hospital or so. And, he, and they asked him again, what did he say? What did she say? What, who, who was it? And he said at the time, I don't really remember. 
but he did remember and he said exactly what uh what they had said and uh so i could give you the answer to the book well was was mrs alazarov in the car with you uh, or was she in it because that's very important what she says in the historic in the because she said you know both things he said he was in the car and he said that he had been who who did it right and, um he But didn't that, want to say because he didn't at the, at the retrial because he didn't want to stir up the politics and it was right. amazing to him that this that the political issue was remaining so uh alive right and, And and it still is. It's still something that is discussed, which is you know, which is crazy because, uh, as you point out, Sibar Lozarov uh, said at first it was one, and then later on it was uh, another. You know uh, that she kept changing her testimony, and uh, evidence that would appear and disappear and and blow up, and uh, you know. The, All kinds of things happen to change the uh, to change the the opinions in the book. Yeah, <laughs> and, but not not of the people who were judging this thing, this this whole uh, case, because their decisions were political. Yeah, it had nothing to do with the facts. The facts were kept 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 changing. There are other so Karen, things. Karen, are you going to tell us or you're not going to tell us? Uh, sh should I, uh, Jonathan, should I tell you? No, I... not reveal what the book, but tell us what your father-in-law said. Oh, he said it was Arabs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of it. It doesn't mean, because it wasn't, it wasn't determined in the retrial or the trial. So what my father-in-law said and he said to me at the age of in his, uh 80 or so he said yeah that to me and he said uh, uh i just didn't want to bring it up no. uh i said i'm an old man and i don't remember anything so he may be and he may have been an old man that didn't remember anything so because they, the, the, so the weight I, of the, you know, the weight of the evidence is is quite strongly in the other direction so right. but not you know right so that it's, it's not it's not it's never clear it's not clear uh but to answer, that. yeah to answer your question about why i keep going back to dipping into that well as the british mandate i think it's either just the complete failure of imagination on my part that you know i have nowhere else to go um <laughs> or uh or there's or i or i don't really want to psych myself out but there's clearly something about brits and jews that i'm trying to work out for myself um that i may but i mean you know but i'm able to tell a story about that uh that goes i hope way beyond my own my own attempts to to figure that stuff out but it, it offers a kind of um uh breeding ground for uh, identity issues that uh i mean if i think about it you know one of the uh uh you know if i think about my childhood in in england and uh i don't think before 1967 that most english jews were much interested in in israel at all and and that certainly like uh in hebrews apart from certain movements like my cousin wendy i saw is here and her sister was in habonim i remember but like um and connie um but that i think we went to hebrew school and and they were pretty much determined to make it so awful that nobody would ever want to have anything to do with hebrew or israel you know uh, because i think most people's parents were scared that their children would would move to israel not for their children but just they didn't want them out of the country it, it, there was something to be scared of because there were all these if you remember all those volunteers coming to, to, uh, 
I was one of them, yeah. Inno inoculating chickens against Newcastle disease. And, but that was why I asked you about before about love, the, uh, uh, relationships, and history, and what you know what you said about relationships was you know that all relationships are are, are in, uh, infected by history that they're, they're determined in a way by history, but you have some very uh, strong erotic scenes that are. Uh, um, more than history, uh, and uh, yeah. The, what do you the, want me to say about them? <laughs> no, I, I know. I, I what. <laughs> what I want to say is that they balance the book in a way. The novel becomes much more alive, yeah, uh, uh, than historical facts. And I wanted to know whether you were doing it because some editor said to you, uh, you know. Put no. Something, uh, put something. <laughs> oh no 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 not at all. Well, Karen is trying to help make sales. Okay, all right. Uh, you know who who uh, wants who wants no, a historical no, novel, but a really, juicy erotic exactly. novel. Oh, no, exactly, exactly that, exactly. Um, it's it's lucky I can still remember what erotic is, <laughs> you know. But at this stage, but um, but yeah, no. Of course, there has to be a love story, and um. Uh, you know, uh, Siona, Karen, you know, my wife is a painter and uh, uh, I drew a lot on, uh, to a degree on not all aspects, but certain aspects of her being are, are filtered into that, into that character. Although, you know, I will say that I, um, um, I did uh, also um, have Siona Tagger, the painter, as a as a model, not for the erotic uh, part of it, but um, in terms of the experience of being an artist in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in 1933. Um, but uh, no, the love story in, in, enabled me, and there are there are two women who, who who Ivor gets involved with. One is an American. An American debutante from Baltimore, and the other is a Palestinian Jewish woman, a woman of the Yeshua. Um, and that enabled me to, uh, yeah, to, I mean, you know, I was on, I was on uh, something of some panel the other day, and oh, 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 I think it was also came out of Israel. And some someone asked me, you know, they said for people who are who want to be writers, and I know there are a number of writers who are here today they, they said do you have any what do you tell your students I used to, and I said I used to tell my students don't don't bore me you know and don't don't bore yourselves and don't um and uh you want to write a novel that people want to turn the page or at this stage but there's but there's more than going on okay maybe yeah. you want to expand on the love stories, okay, not just around your central character. I mean, the love story with Elozarov and and Goebbels, I, I his don't, wife, daughter, I don't, and yeah, the Goebbels thing. I, I don't think there's any evidence to support that. I think it's just a rumor, and uh, and I don't think there's ever been anything um, concrete to uh, to suggest that they were anything more than than school friends. And it, it seemed to me. Um, that there's been uh, the uh, sensa sensationalism, that it's a desire to have, um, you know, Goebbels' wife involved romantically with Alozarov. But I, I've never, of everything that I've read, I've never actually seen read anything that's convinced me that that, that that was the case. There doesn't seem to be any evidence at all. It's just something people, for sensational reasons, people want to imagine. Fake, fake news back then. Um, but have you been able, maybe you want to elaborate because people don't know perhaps what I'm referring to, but did you find the source of that rumor? Who put it out? No, no, not really. I, I, I didn't really. And, uh, and, you know, and as I said, I'm not a historian and I'm, 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 it's not something that I wanted in the novel because I thought it would, it would tilt it in ways I didn't want it to go. It would be very distracting. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
what you have is a very clear, very clear story that goes um, goes through the the uh, uh, you know goes through the plot. It doesn't the it does plot doesn't stop for a minute, and and because my my uh, my husband's grandfather was a builder and built the casino and built these places that you're talking about. I can fact check every step, every step they take. <laughs> Everything that it seems to be a novel is yeah. is based on reality, but always moves forward. There's always uh, and and I, I I will confess that I don't think King Kong actually played at the Esther Cinema, but never mind that. <laughs> no, there are, there's some other things there too, but that, never mind <laughs> the novel. <laughs> There is a question, Jonathan, on your writing practice. Um, as a writer, how do you how do you do it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mean when when do I write? That, that, when, uh, I, I'm, when the, I'm quoting from the question. Oh. What is your writing practice? Oh well, uh, I generally uh, write in the mornings. Uh, for and no more than about two hours a day, so I I think that's uh, and I I never write when during in when there are Premier League games on or or <laughs> Champions League games or any other game and any game involving Tottenham Hotspur. I, I okay, never... okay, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I write I, I, when I'm writing. I, I, and in the afternoon, I'll sometimes uh, go over what I've written and and revise. But but I find that my uh, creative abilities, you know, are at their peak for a couple of hours in the morning. Um, pretty much, that's it. That's it. Did you know where you were going when you started this book? Did you know? Did you outline a plot, or did you? Uh, are you dreaming um, in the morning? Well, uh, the, the the first the first version of the I I only half knew where I was going. It turned out because in the first version of the novel, um, the, there were half the novel was set in the past in 1933 to four, and half the novel was set in the present, and involved a, a journalist. Based very loosely on, I think I saw Martin Fletcher. Are you there in the? I was a, um, on uh, a journalist who's is in Tel Aviv who's researching the uh, uh, Lazarov murder, looking back into it. And uh, and I wrote a whole novel with half set in the past and half in the present. And at some point, I realized that it wasn't working. And that uh, that the back and forth was not working, and uh, so I eliminated everything that was in the present, and then plunged myself back into the past. Um, and of course, you know, you can't change the historical fate. Um, you know, so I had that spine of what had actually happened. I wasn't going to mess around with that. Um, and into that world, I through these fictional figures. But it's also such a fascinating, and merge them with, you know, I mean, you know, uh, Gershom Sholem is, pops up, uh, Einstein pops up, you know, you had Hebrew University in that year, I think the Board of Governors was Freud and, <laughs> Freud and Einstein. You know, it's like not about, but there were only about 12 students. So, you know, it was like a top heavy Board of Governors um and but like it, it's just an extraordinarily fascinating period um so i didn't didn't know where i was going you don't want to know too much about where you're going i certainly didn't know where i was going in uh iva's relationship with siona and with susanna that emerged um as i was writing and how is your your this now being your third book received in in england um it hasn't <laughs> it well, let's say your two previous books your two I'll tell you previous some, well i'll tell you something interesting about that 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 um 
they they all my my books have been received much much better in America than than in England, and uh, this is uh, maybe you know personal experience probably irrelevant, but like I only recently discovered that my agent, my American agent, who I've been with for many many years, that her her UK agent uh, did never sent the book out in England. He said it wasn't right for the market. And when I asked her wow. why why it wasn't right for the market, she said, I don't know, something to do with Jerusalem. And I think we know what that means. So um, so uh, I hope that they, at some point, you know, somebody in England gets to take a look at it. But maybe, you know, maybe maybe it's better not to get what you wish for you know because who knows what the response would be but um uh i don't know you know but i mean all my books before this one have come out in the uk and i of course would like this book to come out in the uk but i don't know but here it's doing just fine the response has been really amazing for a book that's yeah. only, uh, only just out yeah, it's been really nice, and there's a very nice review in the LA Times coming on 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 Sunday that I'm hoping that Spielberg will read while he's having his coffee, you know, and his bagel. Yeah, we all hope that. Um, <laughs> let me let me just interject for a minute. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but last week there was a sort of a rock musical um, immersion theater event in Jerusalem. Called Who Killed Chaim Alozarov? No, I didn't know that. It was it was quite amazing. I don't know if anyone in the audience uh, also went to uh, to a performance. It was quite amazing. It was sort of uh, um, gothic genre um, in an abandoned building um, in the heart of Jerusalem, and everything that you've described um, was played out. The speeches were played out. Um, the characters um, were the same characters, oh. the Arab and the Jews and the right wing and the left wing. And um, in the end, in the end, it was, okay, everybody, let's dance on the blood of Chaim Alozov. Yes. Uh, wow. Because, because okay. it became such a farce. The whole thing was a farce. Who killed Alozov? Wow. The whole trial was a farce. That's the way it was portrayed in this musical. It was all turned into a fuss i mean I, they I say they looked at history as that yeah it, that's amazing and uh, no i didn't know about it and thanks for for telling me um if you read the transcript of the trial it wasn't a fuss i mean the the, the trial was uh, quite extraordinary and the and the level of uh, detail that the respective barristers on the prosecution and the defense went into is is you know, there's the they amassed an enormous amount of evidence. It's it's just fascinating. It, it's it's one of the things that, that they of course they were out 90, in the play. ninety years later. Right. One of the things they brought out in the play was the suspicion. Well, this I actually learned from Karen. I didn't know this that um, Alozorov was alive when he got to hospital. Yes. Yes. I always was. thought that he was killed, but he wasn't oh. killed on the spot. Oh. And oh, right. there are all these rumors, of course, it could yeah. be like the previous one you talked about, fake news, that um, the doctors messed up in the operating yeah. theater, somebody, there yeah. was all this was played out. Yeah, that's in my novel. And, and I don't think, I'm not sure that was a rumor. But um, Can you elaborate? Just tell us that the old Not really. <laughs> I don't want to give everything that happens away. In the, okay. In the... To read the book. And you can get it on Amazon if if you're uh, uh, yeah. you know if if you uh, if you can't buy it because we can't buy it directly we have to by the time it gets here it takes about a couple of weeks so you can buy it on Kindle and you can mm -hmm. uh, or you support can, Israel get it on Stimatsky. Yeah. It's also an audio book with a guy with a very nice English accent. So yeah, and he does other accents well, but the. Uh, the essence well, I haven't of heard it. Yeah. the uh, the idea of suspense, I thought, was really well 
uh, organized. Thanks. That, you know, this is a trial that everybody in Israel knows about. I don't know if anyone out, outside of Israel cares because I saw my one of my friends uh, left right in the middle because he said, you know, I don't know any of this. Uh, um, but I know that it is a something that has been gone over and over and over. And yet this is the book turns out to be uh, one surprise after another. And there are facts that you had uh, that, that all of us have. And yet we didn't know that we didn't know it this way. Uh, so I think that that's a very interesting uh, uh, element that uh, that that. I, that is something I want to learn how to do. <laughs> Can you teach well, me? Uh, I, you know how to do it. But um, I, I'm trying to evoke a world, a gone world. And and I'm, I'm interested not only in the uh, Lazarov trial, but also in capturing that world of, of Palestine in, in 1933, um, which was, by the way, you know, tiny relatively tiny population uh Never that's mind. another thing that, that it's hard to get hold of that tel aviv was like a village you know was um, uh there people everyone knew everyone else in tel aviv yeah. and uh I, in the 70s in the 80s some letters were uh, found in a suitcase on the street in tel aviv and they put them in the paper. They did an article about these girls, these teenage girls in the in the twenties, who were writing love letters to about you know they were writing about their love lives to each other. And when the article came out, my mother in law looked and she said, "Oh, that's Ella. That's <laughs> that's this." And she said, "I didn't know." Mm -hmm. I mean, she threw out all her papers at that point. I had um, somebody somebody reviewed. Uh, the the novel in a small um, a book review that came out of Washington D.C. It was reviewed by a young uh, a woman who was a novelist, and she said she had a couple of quibbles about the novel. One was she said nobody in the 1930s just went to bed with someone a couple of days after they met them. And I thought, oh yeah, you really know how everybody behaved in the 1930s. You know, like the prudish bunch. They went. You know, like Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, they weren't doing anything. And then she said, the other thing was you have a, you have a young American woman who drinks and prohibition didn't end until 1933 in the United States. So why was she drinking in Palestine? <laughs> well, you know, it's like that happened. And also during prohibition, people drank, you know, here's some, but it was, it was bizarre. But it was, one went to Palestine to escape prohibition. <laughs> Uh, exactly, and, and drinking was very because of the British, the the business of whiskey got became very popular in the thirties. Uh, and Scottish beer with Hebrew writing on it that was sold at this, you know, with a with a picture of on it of uh, beer with a picture of it a, a British guy on a horse with a pith helmet was one of the most popular. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you know that for a novelist is just meat and drink you know that's really that's really what you want to know is not who killed our Lazarov, but but what kind of cigarettes were people smoking exactly the cigarettes what you wore what you didn't wear what you, you know, the 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 way the weather affected people without air conditioning uh right all kinds, right. Of, all kinds of little details that um uh, I found fascinating. Um, do we have other questions? Uh, because I'm, I could, I would like to, you know, keep going. But uh, I, I think that, uh, I think that perhaps we have worn well, out. One, one of the questions that were asked, which I, I think that you answered, is, um, can you elaborate on how, in your view, the murder is still relevant to our present political situation? So. Yeah, well, I, I think I did say that right at the beginning, that, that it's a sort of, that I think there was a the schism between left and right, the Alozarov is a, it, murder it, uh, made that concrete. 
and uh, and I don't think it's ever. It's just got wider and wider as as the as the years of as the years have gone by. Um, I mean, look, you know, I mean, even though um, the, I should say this, that the, the, the revisionists had their own plan for getting Jews out of Europe, which involved getting Jews out of Poland and stuff. It's not that like anybody was against having Jews come into the Yeshuv, um, but uh, it it was it was about you know doing a deal with the nazis that that was the opposition um not too different to you know those who oppose doing a deal with arafat from the point of view of the right yeah. right that's why before i ask you about begging and reparations um yeah. not begging in the commission but oh, begging right. and reparations and uh I don't know about that, about the referendum. Oh, well, there was all, what we see today of um, the demonstrations outside the Knesset, that was exactly the same that happened in the in 50s with Begin leading um, riots um, against the Knesset. Oh, right. right. Against reparations. I mean, it was a terrible time. I mean, you know, were you a supporter of Nazis or not? Are you, are you got blood on your hands or not? Right. Um, yeah. Very similar. Yeah, but all of our times are terrible. But I have to add one thing. Uh, Mark Levinson had the solution to the Arlozarov murder, and I had never. He had the solution. He said, "His wife killed him." <laughs> I thought that was the best solution. So <laughs> I said that, and I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> his wife owned. A pistol that matched the bullet that killed Arlozarov. His wife was cozy with the chief of police in Jerusalem. And his wife also. That's uh, great. His wife also. My father-in-law said when he wanted to take his wife to the hospital, she said she was busy. Uh, <laughs> yes, and uh, of course the business of his being cozy with Mrs. Goebbels yeah. uh, might have entered into it, but was only typical of our Lozarov's behavior. He was quite a womanizer. So were they all. <laughs> well, uh, our Lozarov is out of the picture by about page 10 of my novel, so that's, that's, for, another, that's for another novel. But yeah. Well, Alozarov left his own pistol at home when he went to Germany, and uh, and he said when he came back that he didn't. He felt he didn't need it. He said, "No Jew is going to kill me." Well, he was all also worried about airport security. I mean, he could never have gone through with a pistol. Uh... <laughs> Probably went by the <laughs> train. Yeah, you have. I... You can now move to uh, uh, Kessner's murder, and uh, which is almost almost the same. And you can uh, you we've got lots of uh, lots of stuff that you can write about here. I think I think I'm done. <laughs> I think you're done. I think you can write about America. I'm with the man. <laughs> yeah. Over now. Yeah. Well, um, I think on behalf of the. Uh, the Writers Association in Israel. We want to thank you for thank you. so much of your time and so many of your secrets. And, and I'm sure that everyone will want to read the book. Uh, I hope so. Well, thank you for having me, Karen. It was really a thrill. And it was somehow nice to be to be back in in, in Israel, even via Zoom. Yeah, so, us, so. A great pleasure for me. Thank you. Please let us know when you're back, actually, physically in the country. I mean, we build up an event around you and other writers. It would be great. That would be wonderful. I'd love that. Thank and, you. Yeah, Karen and I had a lot of fun in Tel Aviv, didn't we, Karen? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so this was a, a very... 1977 uh, to 8. Yeah. I have other on, things. On the do. promenade at the end of Elozorov Street. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yes.
Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Jonathan. And we shall have a, another, uh, another event when you come here. Wonderful. Everyone go off mute for a minute and just give uh, a round of applause. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was fantastic. Very kind. Thank that you. That was awesome. Oh. Thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you so much. It's really kind of you. All right, guys. Thank you, Jonathan. Happy birthday. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> Happy birthday.